I'm Mark Greenfield, and as chairman of the Associated Student Speakers Program, I'd like to welcome you to another program in our noon lecture series. Today's guest is a candidate in California's 1970 gubernatorial race and is currently serving as Democratic leader in the State Assembly. Mr. Unruh formally served as Speaker of the Assembly and headed the California delegations to Democratic conventions for both John and Robert Kennedy in 1960 and 1968. He authored the Unruh Civil Rights Act and has vigorously opposed tuition at the University of California. <laughs> Mr. Unruh's talk today is not only timely because of the Regents' meeting, but he has selected UCLA as the first college address of his campaign. <laughs> I take pleasure in introducing Assemblyman Jess Unruh. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. I uh, want to set the record straight very quickly. I really had selected uh, Long Beach State from uh, my first address. But uh, they had a better show down there. And I'm not, I'm not going to try to match that one. Also, I want to say, I think that we just have to crack down on this irresponsible uh, student press. And after reading the front page of the uh, UCLA paper today, which quoted me as being for tuition, I um, understand what Spiro Agnew has been talking about. <laughs> I also want to make a very quick confession in my campaign, because uh, those fellows that keep applauding back over there, don't you know that all politicians take those things personally and that if you uh, keep on applauding at the wrong places, I'm going to feel that uh, you're for Ronald Reagan? <laughs> are there, are there, is there someone here for Ronald Reagan? Well, you don't, you don't have a very good memory, because I never defended what went on at uh, People's Park, and, uh, or what went on at Santa Rita, and I wouldn't. You're for Ronald Reagan? Would you stand up so that everybody here could see you? <laughs> no, she's really... Now, uh, who's for Sam Yorty? Now, would you, would you stand up? Now, that happens to be a fellow. Now, would you come up here and sit with this young lady and... Uh, <laughs> our, so that the rest of us could get down to the business of governing this state? I do have a confession to make, as I started out to say, which uh, I re was reminded of when I mentioned uh, Vice President Agnew. And I think that uh, before uh, I start this campaign, I ought to get all of my skeletons out of the closet, just in case someone uh, discovers later on some of them and uh, chides me for uh, trying to hide something. Back in 1967, there is an organization in Washington called the Good Government League, and uh, they give an award every year to one Democrat and one Republican for uh, outstanding public service. Now, most of the time, the Democrats they give that award to are people like Spencer Holland or Richard Russell, but uh, somehow or another they heard that I was a very strong advocate of, uh, advocate of state government uh, once upon a time, so in 1967 they gave me an award. And the fellow who made that award and said some very nice things about me was Spiro Agnew. And uh, I just want to get that out early so that later on, uh, when someone tries to smear me with that, uh, you, won't, uh, 
you won't accuse me of having tried to, to hide something. You know, it's rather interesting that as we meet here today, the Governor's Board of Regents is meeting downtown to decide whether or not you or your parents will pay tuition. I think one of the most interesting things to note now is that since the Governor has achieved a majority on that Board of Regents, that it doesn't meet on the campuses anymore. Now, it isn't that the governor doesn't have a great deal of respect for young people. <laughs> now, he really thinks that they're great, because if you heard his State of the State message, you know that he, uh, he called for meaning, <clears throat> meaningful involvement by students in state government. He even wants university and college students to serve on some state boards and commissions. You know, things like the Scenic Highway Advisory Committee, <laughs> the State Veterans Board, <laughs> and the California Exposition and State Fair Executive Advisory Committee. <laughs> now, there are, of course, a few boards on which you can't be trusted to serve, and one of them is meeting right now at 11th and Grand. You know, meaningful involvement, after all, has its limits. The Board of Regents is down there considering tuition and may well agree to some form of it. Now, incidentally, I insist on calling it tuition, despite the fact that the people who are pushing for it continue to talk about a fee increase. And I do this because you may remember a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago to be exact, on this campus, Ronald Reagan said that calling a substantial fee increase anything but tuition would be hypocritical. And I would hate to fit to Ronald Reagan's description of the definition of hypocrisy. No student serves on the Board of Regents, and none is likely to at least for another year. So if and when tuition is imposed before that time, students will have had nothing to say about it. I think we have to count the imposition of tuition as a political victory for Ronald Reagan. It is, after all, his Board of Regents. The elected office holders that came in with him and that came in later on, plus his appointments, do not comprise quite a majority, but he has a strong working majority on the Board of Regents. He has it for a very interesting reason and one which he will not be guilty of in his administration. Pat Brown felt that everyone ought to have a piece of the action. So Pat did not just appoint Democrats or liberals. He made the mistake of appointing a few people on that board who were almost directly opposed to him and to liberal philosophy in general. So that plus what the governor has brought in with him and appointed constitutes for him a strong majority on the Board of Regents. And I will say this, if he is finally able to yet tuition, it will be the fulfillment of his first promise since taking office. He did promise when he came into office that he would come in with a tuition plan and would enact tuition. Well, he now has a majority and it's up to him. He hasn't kept the rest of his promises, but he may well keep this one. And the $360 increase which is the most specific of the plans before the Regents, is very close to what the administration originally proposed, $400, early in 1967. I think you know how that would be arrived at under the plan which has been proposed. There would be a student registration fee increase of $90 in 1970-71, and another $90 on top of that in 1971 and 72. 
and then there would be a new educational facilities fee. Isn't that a nice, a fancy sounding name? That's, uh, that, uh, I think we could, uh, we could uh, expand on that by just having you pay a dollar every time you come on campus uh, in addition to the parking fee which you already pay. So you could put a sort of a head tax on as you uh, came on campus uh, here. And then there are two people here who wouldn't have to pay that. <laughs> or maybe they could just pay 50 cents. <laughs> are you a freshman? Awfully pretty, and I'm sure that some enlightened, handsome fellow will uh, be able to help you in, along here. <laughs> Anyhow, that would increase uh, $90 in 1970, 71, and then another $90 the next year. So that total student charges, including local campus fees, would range from $680 to $715 annually, making the University of California the most expensive public university in the nation. Now, the interesting thing about it is that the governor says the reason he is opposed to that plan that President Hitch has brought in, says the reason he is opposed to that is because it isn't high enough. I don't know exactly what he would propose, but it's interesting that he thinks it's $715 per year is not nearly high enough. Now, out of this rather drastic increase to you would come the magnificent sum of $18.6 million next year, and about double that, according to the most optimistic figures, which I think are somewhat wild, the year after that. But immediately half of that would go for student aid. This is almost a cynical approach to student aid, incidentally, because when the governor first started talking about uh, tuition, he hadn't yet discovered that there are disadvantaged students in this state. At that point, the principal reason for a tuition increase was somehow or another to discipline those kids so that they wouldn't go around breaking windows or they wouldn't go around protesting things, such as the Vietnam War, that didn't sell too well, so now, all of a sudden, it has become terribly popular to charge those of you who are already here tuition so that uh, these newly discovered poor kids can have a better opportunity to come to school. They apparently weren't there last year when we had an equal opportunity uh, educational program before the legislature, which the governor's troops defeated on a straight party line vote, but now they're there this year, and as a consequence, you ought to have to pay, according to their uh, theory, to get them admitted. I think it's extremely unfair, very unwise, and an invitation to further division and dissension within our society to ask those people who have just barely made it out of the poverty level in many cases to pay a tax on education in order to finance those who haven't yet made it out of the poverty level. Quite obviously, the university and colleges are not doing the kind of job in educating poor students that they ought to do. They're not doing the kind of job in educating, being available and open to black students and brown students and poor white students. But the way to finance that is not by charging those people who are just barely existing now, who are just barely able to go to college now, by dragging them down to the point where many of them will not be able to continue to go to college. During three years, we have heard a constant stream of vitriol and vituperation emanating from the governor's office in Sacramento. 
The governor really isn't against everybody at the university. It's just the students, faculty, and the administration. And I used to say, and I said quite hopefully, that he was for the buildings. <laughs> but unfortunately, that isn't true either. Because the university capital outlay budget has been singled out for selective starvation under this administration. It has been in the past, under Governor Warren, Governor Knight, and Governor Brown, typical that about 65 to 75 percent of the capital outlay request made by the university has been granted by those three different political administrations. Last year, that request had been carved to 36.4 percent, and this year it will fall drastically below that. But all state capital outlay is in a buy. Every place where we need to build to take care of our still expanding population is in a buy. Well, if that's the case, then maybe we ought to start charging the felons in prison to build more prisons. And we ought to start charging the mental hospital inmates to build more mental hospitals. I don't understand why students should be singled out to rescue the University of California from the building bind that it is now in. <laughs> Beyond that, that 10 or 11 or maybe 15 million dollars a year that might be netted out of this kind of a tuition proposal will not even pick up the additional money that is required for debt servicing under the new money management policies of the Nixon administration. I think if we're going to engage in the cynical practice of imposing tuition in the name of student aid, we might just as well use all the money raised to redistribute the wealth of families with children at the university and have some real impact on this economy. Well, I've already uh, depicted what I think tuition will do, among other things, and that is, again, to set the lower middle income groups against the poor. It has been a way of life in this administration, and President Hitch himself describes his proposal as striking hardest at those families earning between $8,000 and $12,000 a year. Those blue-collar workers who, by and large, have felt that somehow or another this administration represented some kind of a forlorn hope for them. They have already been hit hardest by the governor's 1967 tax increase and by the high interest rates of the Nixon administration to the point where if today you make between $8,000 a year and $12,000 a year, you cannot buy a home. By law and definition, of the FHA, you cannot qualify today for a home loan if you make between $8,000 a year and $12,000 a year and have three dependents. The Coordinating Council estimates that a $200 tuition would reduce enrollment at the university by 2,675 students next year. Just at the time when the bumper baby crop of post-World War II is beginning to hit the universities. Well, these are the sad facts of life. And I am for you today. And I'm sorry I'm here. I'm extremely sorry. That's not the right place to applaud now, don't do that. I ought to be at 11th and Grand speaking out against tuition, where it would do the most good. One of the reasons, and perhaps the principal reason I am not there, 
not only as a voice against tuition, but as a vote against tuition. And one of the reasons why Ronald Reagan has control of the board today is that a few students felt so strongly about the issues, apparently, that they thought they could accomplish more by being rude, abusive, and in some cases violent. Well, you accomplished something all right. You gave the legislature to Ronald Reagan. And you almost elected Max Rafferty. Didn't quite succeed, but almost. I don't know what's going to happen at the regions today. I would hope there would not be um, kind of disturbances that uh, we've seen in the past. And I would hope that, for some very broad reasons, some very personal reasons, I'm quite sure that if anything does occur there today, it will not help my political chances this year. More importantly, it will not help the chances of anyone who is sympathetic to the continuation and the expansion of free public higher education in this state. But I hope we have not slipped back into the pattern of shouted abuse and violence for another reason. I am profoundly dedicated to finding political solutions and settlements to our problems. And I know those solutions are not found by shouting insults or by jostling the representatives of the establishment, at least not physically. They ought to be jostled in other ways. Solutions and better settlements are found by reasoned argument and through the tedious job of assembling coalitions, sometimes of disparate and even antagonistic people. And that is not an easy task. And it is not much fun. And it doesn't get you much in the way of television headlines. And it has none of the heady intoxication of violence about it. But it does work. And I submit that it is the only way that will work if we are determined today to keep from tearing our society apart. And if you're dedicated to tearing it apart, then there isn't much that I can say to you or anyone else. Except to say this, we have never found a way of executing a society without brutalizing the executioners. And yesterday, we honored a great apostle of social change, a man who brought about social change through nonviolence, Martin Luther King. And it would dishonor all of us if today we forgot what he has taught us. What goes on at 11th and Grand today, you and I will have very little effect on. That course has been set, partially because we have been outworked and partially because we have been outsmarted partially because we have outsmarted ourselves. But what happens to tuition next year and all of the other issues, many of which are far more important, will be determined by where you will be, not today, but the next nine months. And where will you be? Will you be shouting abuse at administrators, who, indifferent as some of them may be to change, are generally powerless to change it. The lever of student pressure for change has been very, very helpful, but in many cases it has used the wrong fulcrum. Instead of levering the governor and the legislature, it has been exercised against those people who, in many cases, have very little to do with it. Will you be leading marches? I hope so, to some extent. 
I hope we will continue to protest our presence in Vietnam. Something which incidentally most people seem to have sort of uh, now begun to slough off on. It's very interesting. I spent uh, most of the day yesterday at uh, Davis and I got uh, not one single question or comment about Vietnam. Or will you be walking the neighborhoods where it is considerably less glamorous, where you will have no television ca coverage, but where you can inform those of you who have Republican parents, conservative parents, I assume a few of you do, informing them of exactly what this administration has done, or in most cases has not done, towards solving the problems of California. Will you be with us this spring organizing so that we will have people in every precinct in this state carrying that message? Will you be with us this summer doing the fantastically large job of registration which has to be done. There are three million Californians who presently are not registered to vote, most of whom would vote for candidates representing what I think most of you want. And will you be with us again in the precincts this fall, helping to carry the message of hope to those people that you've helped register in the summer? Well, we may not have much impact at 11th and Grand today. But where you are this spring, where you are this summer, where you are this fall, will determine where you are and in large part what you are in January of 1970. And it will determine where I will be in 1970. And I tell you, I want to be in Sacramento in 1970, and I want to have you there with me. So where will we be in 1970? Thank you very much. I'll try to field a few easy questions. Are there mics out in the uh, audience? Sure. Can we tone those li turn those lights down now? Do you suppose? Uh, I can't even. I can't see the uh, questioners out there. Could we uh, turn the switches down on the lights uh, here so I can see the questioners? Where are the photographers? Thank you. Mr. Unruh, it's, you know, I've been sitting here and I think it's very easy to bait an obvious fascist and make, uh, you know, nice comments about a group, you know, comments which you think will win an audience over about a, about a very small but very fervent left in this country. You know, I've listened to you and I have heard no, no action programs which talk to the people of this state. I want to know where you stand on solutions to tuition. Are you ready to tax large corporations? Where you stand on housing in this country? Are you willing to cut into the defense appropriations and build the adequate housing and supply food, food for people? Are, are you ready to nationalize the automobile industry so they do not pollute us out of existence and create the rapid transit systems which, which people can get to the places they want to go. This has to be one of the most screwed up states transportation wise and I consider you responsible for that. You and the Democrats who led this goddamn state for 16 years.
Well, you're about as accurate as Ronald Reagan is. First of all, you'd, uh, you're not even accurate on the amount of time the Democrats were in control of the state. You are accurate on a couple of other things. Answer! That's, that's not an answer, fellow, if you'll just wait a little bit. Your problem is you don't even want to wait for two minutes uh, on anything. But let me ask you what you've done about it besides Here. scream and holler. I'll tell you what I did about it, sir. I grew up in, uh, in Oklahoma where my older and brother and sister died of starvation, and I'm not about to tolerate that for my children. Well, and, if, you nice know, I've like. watched politicians like you with quick wits willing to bait people but not willing to come up with progressive solutions, and that's, that's why Ronald Reagan comes into office. Let me say that uh, I grew up in Texas too, and uh, hitchhiked out here as soon as I was as soon as I was big enough to know better. And I assume you did the same thing. I'm going to answer the question. Just be patient. I'm not going to be pushed into anything by Ronald Reagan or by uh, anyone else that uh, that feels there are simplistic, easy answers to things. There are not, and you ought to know that better than anyone. And if you don't, then we're not doing the kind of a job at the university that we ought to be doing. Let me say I am ready to tax the corporations. I have proposed and will support the, depletion, the total elimination of the depletion allowance. I have proposed and will support the elimination of the home office exemption for insurance companies. I will support uh, an increase in our bank and corporation tax. During the course of this administration, the percentage of state revenues that we derive from each tax source has fallen insofar as the bank and corporation and insurance taxes are concerned, have risen drastically from the income tax and the sales tax and the property tax. I think we can treat capital gains in a considerably better fashion so that we do not leave open the door to wild speculation that we have today. And I propose that and will support that. I have, in addition, uh, proposed and supported and enacted the only halfway decent air pollution uh, control legislation there is on the books anywhere in this nation. It's not good enough, I agree, and we ought to go considerably further, and I'm prepared to support that. And if we don't, if we can't get the automobile industry to do that, then I'm prepared to support banning the reciprocating internal combustion, uh, combustion engine. But let me say to you, my young friend, that nationalizing the automobile industry is not going to buy you very much if you think that's going to clean up pollution. The worst polluters in this state are governmental units. The city and county of San Francisco pours more pollution into the San Francisco Bay than all other polluters combined. That's supposed to be nationalized, or at least the people are supposed to own it, or somebody owns it, I don't know. But at any rate, and that's not a single instance. That's not a single instance. I support the institution of the withholding tax on personal income so that those people who come into the state and work for a while and leave before the state is, before they ever pay any income tax, cheat the state out of its tax. We've lost $350 million in the last three years to those tax cheats because this governor has some esoteric theory of taxation which precludes him from being for the withholding of personal income taxes. Now, if you can't discern the difference in that statement and some glib politician who comes out here simply to bait another politician, then I would advise you to take a couple of more basic political science classes. You might not learn much in them. Bullshit. Mr. Edra. A uh, moment ago, you mentioned several possible... I'm sorry I took that long, but uh, he took almost that long que in the question. You mentioned several possible sources of revenue. If all of your uh, tax ideas were enacted, what sort of uh, impact would this have on mm -hmm. your university budget? Uh, Percentage-wise, would this result in a large increase, or, or are we simply in a situation where there is no money, no matter what? 
Well, I do not think we have begun to devote the amount of resources in this state that we need to devote to education. Peter Drucker says that we are in the knowledge economy, and I'm inclined to agree with that where almost the majority of our people are involved in one way or another in the search for and production of and dissemination of knowledge. And it seems to me that we could say with certainty that the principal business of the state of California is education. And we rank somewhere about 32nd insofar as the amount of our state revenues that we allocate to high public higher education. As a consequence, I think we have not reached that, but I think it will require some reordering. We still spend $9 million a year on county fairs, where we have such nice things as jam making and jelly making contests, and I'm not opposed to that. I enjoy both of them, and, uh, as, uh, but I think that if we cannot afford to properly uh, finance our educational plants, then we cannot afford those kind of luxuries either. I think that we, uh, I don't think we have to have a drastic increase in taxation. If we simply close the loopholes that we ought to close, we should be able to finance this state for quite some time in the future. In perhaps not an adequate way, I suspect that there is no answer, no final solution, as there is indeed hardly any final solutions to any ongoing social problem uh, to the financing of education or to uh, governmental services in general. But we can do a better than we're doing now. Bob Kennedy used to be terribly fond of quoting Camus on exactly what, uh, what I'm saying here, and I think much more pungently, who said uh, that uh, there may always be starving children, but there can be fewer children who starve. Yeah, Mr. Unruh. You know, it's very, you're very good at baiting. You spent most of your time here baiting people. First, you bait Ronald Reagan and don't explain the differences between you and Ronald Reagan. I can't see them. And you sit around and, and, and try and pick up one or two supporters of Ronald Reagan in the audience and try and bait them, make examples of them. Well, it seems to me that you're no different from most of, of the corrupt politicians that we have in this country. And what are the real differences between you and Ronald Reagan? Both you and Ronald Reagan criticize student activists without criticizing the source of student activism activism, the impression that creates the student activism. Both you and Ronald Reagan, Reagan have sat on the Board of Regents of this university without criticizing the makeup of the Board of Regents of this university. Both you and Ronald Reagan have not criticized the genocide of the Panthers that is rampant all over this country. You and Ronald Reagan have the same position on genocide. Both you and Ronald Reagan have offered no alternative to alternatives to tuition. Both you and Ronald Reagan have not spoken up against ROTC and other institutions on this campus that promote and perpetuate the wars of imperialism. Both you and Ronald Reagan held exactly the same position during the People's Park issue on private property. I ask you, what are the differences between you and Ronald Reagan? Would you listen if I told you? Don't try the baiting technique again. Let's hear. You sound just like that other fellow that talked over there a minute ago. Very cute, very cute. Well, I would think that as, uh, I would hope that if what I think is true of students today, and that they are informed as well as concerned, and I would not have to answer that question because every statement he just made, every statement he just made is totally and completely wrong. I have proposed an alternative <laughs> to tuition. I have opposed the Vietnam War. I opposed it at some cost to my own political career. When, when I did you oppose ROTC? At the uh, Regents meeting in, uh, in uh, Berkeley in uh, February of 1968. And if you don't recall it, to go read the San Francisco Examiner's editorial. When did you oppose the genocide of the Panthers? I called for a high-level commission investigation into the entire situation. When did you oppose the genocide of the Panthers? When I'm convinced that there is a genocide move, I will oppose it.
just as, I, as I've opposed the police before when they've been wrong. Over here. Uh, say, uh, I just want to just say something to you, you know, because like uh, you're all like, just like all the politicians, you crooked, you ain't no good, you ain't serving no interest to no people. So stop all this bullshitty ass jiving. And you students out here, you know, if you ain't working for the people in terms of the working class people, talking about lower class whites, you know, blacks, and Chicanos, so on and so forth, you know, what I want to see is I want to see the abolishing of the regions, you know, and then set up a board, you know, made up of workers, you know, Chicano workers, you know, black workers, uh, and lower class white workers, you know, and get rid of these motherfucking crooked ass politicians. I say down with all of them. Well, there's the, um, there's... There's the one appellation in that group you used that I'm not entitled to, and that's the politician, because on the basis of what's been happening to my party the last few years, I don't think we can lay claim to being very good politicians. So let me say that, uh, however, uh, if you can slough aside some of the unnecessary things you said, I think the, the gist of what you said to just then is it makes a great deal of sense. And I do think that a Board of Regents that had uh, some carpenters on it, uh, some uh, bricklayers, some, uh, some students, some faculty members, some, uh, uh, some just general uh, average Americans could do a better job than the present board of 16 millionaires, 15 millionaires, uh, eight politicians and Fred Dutton can do. And I have proposed that, if you'd uh, read anything besides the free press. Uh, Mr. Which is Unruh? not too bad reading, incidentally. You've called on the students here to put in considerable effort for your election. A moment ago, I asked you... Not what for my you election, for your salvation. For our salvation through your election. Um, above Haven't you seen those buttons that, that, that says that Jesse saves? I've missed them. <laughs> A few minutes ago, I asked you what the probable impact of your election and enactment of your programs on the university budget would be, and you said that you thought it would be somewhat better, although not good. Could you go into some specifics so we'll know what we are uh, supposed to be working for? Well, I don't know what you want in the way of specifics. I think that the university ought to get considerably more than 15 percent of its requests on capital outlay. I don't suggest that they're entitled to 100 percent any more than, I'm in, uh, than I think the agricultural interests are entitled to 100 percent in this state. But I think they ought to get considerably more than that. I think they ought to get more than the 36 percent, which they got last year, or the 42 percent, which they got the year before that. And I think we ought to have an educational opportunity program, at least along the lines of the legislation which I have carried, which would uh, immediately appropriate another $18 million toward the admission of the present of students who presently, because of the failure of our lower school system, uh, cannot get in, or because of their economic circumstances. That would have uh, allowed some 8,000 students, uh, an increase of 8,000 students annually into our university. Those are the bare, bare minimums that I think we can do. Beyond that, I think we have to begin not just to criticize, and I'm willing to criticize both our universities and our um, elementary and secondary school systems as not having done the job that I think could be done or that we'd like to see them do. But I think we have to begin to offer alternatives, and I will do that. I have a legislation going in on Monday which will allow the contracting out of a catch-up program for those the students at the, the junior high school and high school level who have fallen at least two years behind in achievement in reading and mathematics. Uh, I will allow the contracting out to, uh, to private contractors, and we'll try that. We'll try many other things, including uh, neighborhood control of schools. I think we have that obligation to do. Now, if you want a dollar figure, I can't give you a dollar figure, because I don't know what the, what the legitimate demands are going to be. 
But I say the relatively le legitimate demands of the university ought to be along the lines of what the governing board of that uh, university say they are, and probably somewhat beyond that in uh, certain areas where they are not very sensitive, such as EOP. But uh, what this administration has done is to constantly cut back from even that, even when their own board is in control of the university. Mr. Unruh, I'd like to know where you stand on the uh, California Indian land issue. Uh, I would like to know if you go along with the robbery that this, this uh, government is carrying out right now with the California Indian. They're offering them 47 cents an acre for California land. And that's sheer robbery, 47 cents or nothing. Can you tell me one acre in California that I as an individual can buy for 47 cents? I don't know. If I did, I'd buy it myself. Well, this is what the California Indian is being forced to choose between 47 cents or nothing. Well, I think that's wrong, and I think we have to do something about it. But let me say and uh, admit in all candor that uh, I think almost all of us have been guilty of an ongoing neglect of the problems of indigenous Americans, Indians. But we have, uh, I agree, it is time for a change. But I don't think any of us, including most of you, thought very much about that or understood very much about it or did very much about it until Bob Kennedy began to visit the reservations and expose how bad the situation was there. And uh, I think that's, uh, I think it's necessary that we move massively in helping uh, American Indians out. And California certainly has been among the most remiss. I do not have a program in that area, but I assure you that I will have. When will that be? When I'm uh, elected or before. Towards the end of your speech, you asked for the help of the young people in your campaign. Well, I'd like to ask you, why should we help you if we can't vote? Are you doing anything towards the 18-year-old vote? Yes, I am. What are you doing? I've uh, constantly supported the 18-year-old vote in the legislature. Last spring, I printed the petitions which uh, went out to, for an initiative, which uh, failed miserably, I might add, because not enough students seem to be interested in uh, the 18-year-old vote to do much about it. And uh, right now, I am supporting uh, the initiative drive, which uh, Assemblyman John Burton is uh, spearheading, uh, to place that on the, uh, on the fall ballot. I have uh, contributed to that uh, in every way that I possibly can and uh, intend to continue to that. It's, I think it's up to you as to whether you want, uh, you want the 18-year-old vote or not, because I can assure you not too many people who already have it beyond the age of 25 are very concerned about it. I've done everything I think I can. I'll continue to do that in every way I can, publicly, privately, uh, with what I say and with what I do. But to get 600 or 800,000 signatures on a petition, the legislature will never in God's world enact the 18-year-old vote while there is a Republican majority. Well, until get those, eight, get those 800,000 signatures will depend on whether you really want it or not. Until we can vote, the young people really have little power, and it's in the hands of the, hands of the politicians. And I sure hope if you want our support, you're going to have to get that passed and give us the power, unless you want us to, uh, to demonstrate in such a way that you don't approve of. Do you, would you, uh, you what, what you're saying back here is precisely, is precisely what I hear at every level in California life today. You've got to do it for me. You've got to do it for me. And to this extent, this is the great appeal that Ronald Reagan has to this state is because of that kind of attitude. If you were willing to do a little bit of it for yourself or for the sake of the whole state, and I think a great many of you are, and that's the reason I'm here. If I didn't think that, I wouldn't be here. I'm certainly not making any votes in general here. If I didn't think you were concerned about the same things I'm concerned, I wouldn't be here. But you can't just slough off a problem and say, you better get it on. You better get it on, and I'll help. Firstly, there was a person standing in line here who had to run off to class, and he asked me to ask you this. Uh, he was saying if you were speaking to an American Legion uh, audience, which he claimed to remember of, you can clarify that, uh, how would you represent the issues of Angela Davis and academic freedom? Uh, then I wanted to ask you, 
Uh, it, it seems that sometimes it's, uh, it's good to be for youth and sometimes we, we turn uh, against them depending on what the time is. You, you talk presently about uh, shouting uh, abuses and you seem not to mention about uh, students who a few months ago picketed seemingly very peacefully downtown at the Extension Center uh, against the Regents and then they went to hundreds of persons around the downtown area talking with them for a, a lengthy amount of time on all the issues that they felt uh, concerned the university and, uh, and people downtown. Now, you ask us if we'll be there with you when we're going for that. We'd just sort of like to know, were you there with us? Well, I have, uh, I think my record of uh, support for those things that uh, have been in general enunciated by uh, students uh, is a relatively solid one. I don't say I've been with you on everything, nor do I propose to. I like to think that nobody owns me 100%, and uh, that's the way it's going to continue. But I have been in support of the moratorium movements in the past. I have been in uh, uh, public loud opposition insofar as tuition is concerned. I have been uh, spoken out on the Angela Davis case. I said that I thought it was the law of the land as interpreted by the courts, and I'm willing to abide by that. I've uh, spoken out against the atrocities which took place at the People's Park in Santa Rita, and I don't uh, know what more else, uh, what else you'd like. I didn't come here today to praise you, just as I don't go somewhere else to criticize you. I came here today to tell you the things the way I see it and to tell you that I think we need each other and if I haven't convinced you of that then I haven't done a very good job and if you don't understand that need then God help all of us because uh, he's the only one left that can. For a little bit of clarification, th this person had asked you how you would present uh, an argument not, he, asked, he wanted to ask sort of both ways. How would you speak to students on the issue of academic freedom, and then how would you speak to an American Legion I've audience? spoken to both students and, and the American Legion in exactly the same fashion, and that's the reason I'm not coming here today and telling you how great you are. I think you know that. If you don't know it from the other speeches I've made, everybody who thinks you're terrible knows that I think you're great. Thank you. In terms of abiding by the courts also, does that mean that the PAC decision we would abide by and then the, the latest decision on Angela Davis we would also abide by. Could you just clarify that? Thank yes, you. I do. If the, court, if the court reverses that, then I intend to abide by that also because I'm not going to pick and choose as to which laws I obey. I intend to obey all of them. Uh, Mr. Andrew? Your mustache doesn't match his. Uh -huh. Neither does yours. Uh, Mr. Andrew, uh, you said uh, just a couple minutes ago about uh, picking and choosing laws, and uh, earlier you mentioned about the war in Vietnam. I'm over here. And uh, <laughs> yesterday there were uh, a group of uh, interested people down at the LA Induction Center. There were also a bunch of people over in uh, Oakland, and uh, a lot of them were arrested. And uh, frankly, I didn't see your face there. Frankly, I've never seen your face at any physical show of support to bring the troops home or to end all the wars that the United States has been carrying on. All I've heard is a bunch of talk, which I've heard from every politician I've ever seen. And uh, I'd just like to know how far, how far you're willing to go with the laws of the United States of America. Well, I did not mean to say that laws ought not to be protested, or even that they ought not to be disobeyed. I would say that uh, you ought to be prepared to accept the consequences of that if uh, that is the case. And that was the, I thought, the great appeal of Martin Luther King. And I think he managed to change some of those laws that were terribly wrong by that kind of, those kind of tactics. And I think you noticed the great silence that uh, surrounded the White House yesterday in, on the, the anniversary of his birth date, because apparently they do not feel that that ought to be encouraged. But let me say, I haven't seen your face those uh, demonstrations either, and I don't see you in jail. Um, I was right. I was right there yesterday, and I see you. you. I never seen you any place. 
except up in your office or something. Well, that's uh, that's uh, too bad. I um, can you see me up here today? Yeah, and all I hear you is talking and not doing anything. Just every goddamn politician I've ever seen. Why don't you do something with your life, Christ? How the hell can you answer that? <laughs> I'll take one more speech. I'd like to know what you plan to do or what have you done about discrimination in housing. We're over here this time, <laughs> I know about the FEPC and I've done business with them and I was told that they could only do so much, and I would have to hire a lawyer to go any farther. So, um, would you would you speak a little closer into the mic? I can't hear you. I'd like to know what you plan to do, or what you have done about discrimination in housing, other than um, the um, FEPC and um, what it can do. What else do you think should be done? I don't know. I don't have the answers. I'm not a politician, but I have been. Well, let me say that I carried the first uh, civil rights bill in the state, which. Uh, which affected the sale or rental of housing, the Under Civil Rights Act, which is still on the statute books, and which in many ways was a broader act than the, uh, the Rumford Act in 1963, which we enacted. I carried it in 1959 when it was not uh, exactly the thing to do, and when uh, I was told even by some of my liberal Democratic colleagues that you can go too far with civil rights, and I uh, supported the Rumford Act with some uh, some trepidation about whether it was going to actually accomplish very much, and I'm not too sure that it has. I'm not at all sure that no matter what we do about discrimination in housing at this point, is going to be very effective unless we are able uh, to pump some economic power, purchasing power, into the hands of those people who are being discriminated against. I think that is the really only long-run solution the discrimination in housing, that if a person has enough money and some tenacity, and with the laws we have in the books now, I think they can get housing. But there are just very, very few people that have the economic wherewithal to get housing today, so the discrimination continues apace. I think we have to find uh, the kind of employment. We, I think we have to pump the kind of, uh, of the capital. I think we have to provide the kind of entrepreneurial training and help in the, in the ghetto and the barrio areas. Uh, uh, that will enable some equalization of the capital uh, control and management uh, and uh, wealth uh, will enable them to compete in the housing market. Yes, Mr. Henry, I'd like to ask you a couple of things. Number one, a lot of us here are history students, myself included, and we have watched in 1964 Lyndon Johnson run as the peace candidate. In 1968, Hubert Humphrey run as the peace candidate. We've watched you support Johnson, support Humphrey in the final election. I'd like to say I do see the difference between you and Ronald Reagan. I'm not for Thank Ronald you. Reagan, but I cannot see supporting, working, giving, or doing anything to support another liberal politician who's got all these wonderful little sayings, wonderful sense of humor, wonderful little ideas, but we have no base of history, no base of fact of any of them getting in power and then doing what they said they were going to do. I don't see how you can say that you were against the Vietnam War when you supported Humphrey, who now is supporting Nixon. I mean, this is all bullshit to me, and I'd like to see why I should finally work for you, why I should finally support you, why I should finally vote for you, when there's no real history, base of fact, of you, that you are really going to do these things when you do get this power and do get in office. <coughs> Before I answer that, let me, let's, let's, let's decide whether we have a rational discourse going on or not. And all I'd right. like to ask you a couple of questions. All right. Now, first of all, can you tell me one person running for public office today or in the relatively near past that you did support? Yes, and Who? I made a mistake, Eugene McCarthy. And then afterwards, I watched Eugene McCarthy turn around, just like all the rest, and his, all his pleas, all his sayings, all his support and everything else became unofficial, nothing, didn't solve anything, didn't support anything, 
The only thing he didn't do was really support Hubert Humphrey. That's the only thing I can really give him credit for. Well, I don't think Hubert Humphrey thinks I supported him either. Well, the day, the, uh, I'll put it this way. The Daily Cal, uh, Daily Bruin did say you did, and I remember statements coming from you saying that you would support uh, this man well, would you against tell, Richard would, Nixon. Would you tell Hubert Humphrey that and uh, George Meany? That would be a big help uh, to me if you would. Gladly, sir. Would you like to answer the question? No, I wouldn't, because I, if you can't think of anyone that you're for... I told you I supported Eugene McCarthy. Right, you did, mistake. but now you're no longer for him. And apparently there is no one on the scene that you support. And I assume that means that there isn't any point in my, in my arguing with you about anything or discussing anything with you because there's no way that I'm going to convince you. No, that's not true. You're, you're, you were saying I'm irrational. I'm saying I'm rational. I'm looking for somebody to support. I, want I didn't a say that at all. You may be the most rational person in the house. It's just that all the rest of us are irrational. Oh, I really I'm don't know how to... I honestly don't know how to have a discourse with you because if that's your premise then I don't think it's possible. I'm not going to be with you 100% of the time. Let me ask you one, the second question I was going to ask. All right. Can you name any piece of legislation that I have carried and passed in the California legislature? The Civil Rights Act you mentioned? <laughs> That's one. You take awfully good notes. Very good. Mental notes. I think you should try doing the same. I will. I'll make a mental note to not to give you the microphone the next time. Right. All I want to know is why should I support you, and why will you do these things when the other people I have supported, the other liberal politicians, have not done what they said? That's all I'm asking. I think you can only judge a politician or anybody else on two bases. One is what he says, and secondly, on what he has done. I say to you certain things today. Quite obviously, you are suspect, and right, rightfully so of anything and everything that a politician says. And I am myself, until I know that politician and know whether he means what he says or not, I know that under most circumstances he will do what he says. I think if you knew me, you might know that even my enemies will tell you that I keep my word. Beyond that, I would think you'd have to go back and research what I have done in the past under other tough circumstances many cases. And I think if you know that, that then you should be for me in contrast to what the alternatives are. And the alternatives are two. The alternatives are to continue to turn back the clock and march back into the 18th century with the present administration, or to resort to the kind of futile efforts which we saw at San Francisco State in 1968 and which we have seen in a few other places in the past. Now, over 15 years, I think my record is crystal clear insofar as an ongoing, continued concern and dedication to closing or at least narrowing the gap between the main body of American society and the rear guard. I do not say that I have steadfastly done everything that you would have liked for me to do, or that many other people would have liked for me to do, or even that I would have liked to have done in every case. But I think the general pattern is crystal clear. I think you will find that I have not, over 15 years, carried special interest legislation. I do not carry the insurance company increases. I do not carry the small loan company rate increases. I do not carry the oil company legislation. The legislation that bears the name of Unruh is in the field of school financing, in the field of equal of educational opportunity, it's in the field of uh, chronic unemployment, it's in the field of uh, civil rights, and uh, I will say I did depart once, I did carry the legislation which created the California Council on the Arts. I hope that's not, uh, not to be um, sully the rest of my um, record. And uh, that's all I can say to you on that basis. If I haven't, if by those measurements, uh, I haven't uh, merited uh, support, then uh, I don't think there's anything more I can say to you. Thank you very much. You've been very nice to me, and I appreciate it.